caused by it in, in either case. Um, I have a few announcements I'd like to draw to, to your attention. These are the ones that are coming up more, more recently, and then please refer to your bulletin for the ones that are coming up a little bit later. Uh, the, uh, uh, speaking of which, um, let me start with this. Immediately after our service, our brother uh, James Wallace, who passed away about a month ago, we will be having a service after this service dismisses, so please uh, uh, consider it a small intermission, and then please reconvene for our service for Brother James Wallace. The second reading of membership transfer requests. So I guess I need a bulletin for this. No, wait, I can do it from memory. So it's uh, Joshua and Annette Owili who are transferring to the Norfolk Church, and uh, Adrian Pristas, who many of you would remember as Adrian Kova, Kova Rubius, is transferring to the Kettering Church. Did I get it right? <laughs> hey, are these, are these brain cells still connecting? <laughs> All right. So uh, we need to take a, a motion, a second, and a vote. So church members, is there someone who would like to create the motion? Thank you. And we second. need a second. Yes, and all those in favor, please raise your right hand. And now we will take the opposing vote. And nobody should leave without at least one person opposing, right? <laughs> Thank you. Next weekend, big weekend, big Sabbath, special potluck, our youth pastor, Jeremy Wong, his wife, Blake, and their baby sister, uh, ba <laughs> uh, baby daughter, uh, <laughs> whose name, which you will, you will have to discover, <laughs> JJ. Uh, special Sabbath, special potluck, please come and uh, be introduced to them uh, at, that, uh, at that time. Uh, in your bulletin, something new, I believe, if you're paying attention, there's something called a Q QR code. QR code, it's this uh, kind of looks like a crossword puzzle that's been miniaturized. And um, what you can do is, uh, if you have one of these, and uh, this is for illustration only, it's turned off, right, which is what yours should be as well. Uh, so you, you can scan this uh, array of dots and it'll take you to the website and you can um, get to the giving page right there. Two weeks from now is our choir vespers. Our choir season runs from September through May or June and they usually cap it off with a beautiful choir vesper concert and that'll be on May the 20th. Yes, believe it, that's only two weeks away from now. It's graduation season, and uh, leading the charge here, simply because this, this is the first name I, I have, is Heather Thorward, and she'll be graduating with a master's in, a master's degree in reading science and intervention. So, you will want to get with her and ask her about the specifics of that degree, okay? Did you catch it? Reading and reading science and intervention. And this is just one of what I think will be several, even many, if you're graduating from high school. Um, please call the church secretary. We'd like to know which high school you're graduating from, what plans uh, you have for for, for a future, uh, university, college. Uh, if you're graduating from any other institution, we would like to know as well so that we can have the complete list and know who you are in our church family and come and congratulate you and encourage you in what lies ahead. Um, and, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, Heather's graduation is a week from today. So a lot's, ha lot's happening on the uh, 13th, a week from today. May God bless you as you continue to worship with us.
In addition to Jeremy Wong, our new pastor, coming next week, we have a musical treat. Men's chorus that I direct from the Bucyrus area will be providing music for the service. It's a 20 voice, 22 voice men's chorus. Uh, singers from all over Crawford County uh, who sing uh, full concerts and secular and sacred music. We'll be doing sacred music, of course, next week. Called U The group is called United in Harmony, so I hope you'll come uh, to enjoy them as well. I have to introduce the principal of our school, but I, I will do it nevertheless. Uh, Valerie Green is the one uh, who is in charge of our school and who is going to be also leading us today in prayer and the call for the offerings. And if you have not been here last Sabbath, you missed a lot because the whole service, second service, was organized by the school. And these 80 kids and their teachers, they did absolutely stunning job. Thank you very much, Valerie. So please, please lead us in prayer. <coughs> Thank you, Pastor Yuli, and good morning, church family. Good morning. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so, so grateful to be here. Lord, Sabbath is just like a fresh wind. 
that blows upon us. I ask that you would bless the service, bless all that are involved, Lord, and may we remember that you made the Sabbath for us. Let us adore you, let us worship you, and let us give you all praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. morning before we collect the offering, I want to offer up just a short story. Um, there was a woman that I knew years ago, and we attended the same church. She was uh, sitting next to me when the pastor got up and laid out his new plan for opening a school. He said, what we have to do first, raise the funds. So I'm going to put out this wonderful plan, and if everyone in the church abides by it, we will have a school in two years. And uh, she was sitting next to me, and she kind of nudged me. And I said, what's wrong? She said, well, you know, I've been giving and giving and giving. I give to everything. I've, I've been on my own plan. Every time I get a raise, the church gets a raise, and God gets a raise. I'm just taking myself out of this plan. And so she gently, you know, she they passed out the pledge cards, and she excused herself from it. And she said that night she went home, and it just started bothering her. But she was still annoyed that they were asking for money. But it wouldn't leave her alone. Sunday, she woke up, and it was still bothering her. And she just said, oh, I guess I'll just go ahead and do this. And so in her heart, she committed to go ahead and start giving a little bit more so that she would be part of the church's plan to raise money for the school. Monday morning, she went to work. And when she got to work, she was having her yearly evaluation, and she was aware of this. When she came out of her evaluation, she was absolutely stunned. She had gotten one of the biggest raises that she had ever gotten in her career. But what was interesting about that, every time she had gotten a raise in the past, she would give a little bit more, like a thank offering. But this time, the raise was so significant, she pulled out her little calculator. She had enough money to participate in the church's plan, keep up with her current rate of giving, and give her bonus offering and then still have extra money left over for what she wanted to do every single week. And even though she was grumbling in her heart at first, you know, she came and told me the rest of the story. She's like, I felt so bad because I'm complaining and I'm, I'm saying I'm not going to do this. She said, but God just blessed me so much. And when she came out of that meeting, she realized that God was asking her to trust him first with the tithe, with the offerings, with the extra giving, and he would bless her. And there's an old saying that says, you cannot beat God giving. And as we think about this, um, the verse that I want to leave with you is Luke 12, 34. It says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So as we give this morning, let's remember that God will always bless us and always take care of us, no matter what we're doing. And giving is a form of worship and praise. May the deacons come forth for their tithe and offering.
Thank you, choir. Thank you for having my back today. And thank you, George. I really enjoy every single time you perform here. Uh, for those of you who do not know, after the second service, after my uh, sermon, those who know Jim uh, Wallace and those who know Juanita, and uh, somewhere I saw your mom. Oh, okay, John is there, and your mom is next to, next to him. So we're going to have a memorial service for Juanita's uh, dad and for Elizabeth's husband, uh, Jim Wallace, uh, who passed away approximately a month ago. Friends, my name is Pastor Julian. For those of you who are new here, I'm the lead pastor of Worthington Seventh Adventist Church, and I'm humbled and very honored by God to be his instrument in preaching his divine word. So today we're going to continue our series on the book of Genesis, which we titled Origins. And I would like to invite our team upstairs to dim the lights in the sanctuary so that you can see our bumper video, our introductory video to the whole series, and then we're going to start with our new uh, sermon today. Heavenly Father, as we open your word, would you please honor us with your divine presence? Bless me, Lord, to hide in your divine shadow, and you be the one shining through me. Bless my brothers and sisters who are going to be listening to your word so that they can understand it and they can keep it safe in a good and fruitful heart. Bless us, Lord, with your presence, we humbly ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and all the people of God said together, Amen. 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 Have you ever wondered, what is God's plan for your life? Have you ever asked the question, is God still dreaming over me? What does he have in store for me? What is the plan, the divine plan of God that he has in his heart, my life? This is a very difficult question, and to be honest, there is not a, an easy answer because the dream of God for us is multifaceted. That means it has many components. It, ha it is omnivalent. It has many applications. Yet today I would like to tell you that one very particular and very important facet of the plan of God for your life, for my life, is to become a foreigner. For the last 20 years of my life, I have lived the life of a foreigner. And it is not because I had to change three different countries of residence and to learn two additional languages. It is more than that. It is this deep 
feeling in my heart of being ruthless, being, or, or being a person uprooted. And even though I am a proud citizen of the United States of America, boy, you are, amen, thank you, dear. Uh, you are so quiet. I mean, you take it for granted that we live in this country. I mean, it's amazing, guys. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you not just to pat uh, you on the shoulder. It's amazing. And even though I'm a proud citizen of this country, every single time I open my mouth, there will be someone to remind me <laughs> that I don't quite belong here. As a matter of fact, over these uh, 20 years of journey, I have had some exposure to some jerks <laughs> who send me back to the place where I'm coming from. And that's okay, you know. The problem is that on these occasions when I have been back to the country where some of you may say, oh, where is your home? And I say, my home is here in the United States. But uh, when I go back to the country where I, where I was born and raised, the strange thing is I'm a foreigner there too. You say, that's impossible. Because you speak uh, English with accent, you must be absolutely fitting well in your own culture. It's not so. And you say, how is it possible? Because every single language and every single culture is in a constant flux, in a constant change. The language changes. If you don't believe me, go and watch a movie from 50 or 60 years ago and listen to how they talk. If you don't believe me, I would like to quote a very famous religious author from hundred and something years ago, where she says, we all have to have intercourse with God and with each other. <laughs> and no, she does not speak your language. She does not speak my language. She speaks the language of the people from 120, 30 years ago, where intercourse meant something different than today, guys. Intercourse meant relationship, conversation, intimate uh, uh, communication with someone. So, I'm a foreigner. And along this journey of being a foreigner, a person without roots, I have realized that it has been always God's plan all along my life, and actually your life that God wanted you to be a foreigner. So today I would like uh, to preach a topic from the book of Genesis that hopefully will convince you that this is the dream of God for you, not just for me, for you, to be a foreigner. I've titled my message today, Strangers and Pilgrims on the Earth. Would you please uh, grab your Bibles? Let's open them together to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And I understand in our time and culture, some of you carry your Bibles uh, on these devices. And I hope besides Facebook, you have also the book, the Bible on these devices. So flip the electronic pages to the book of Genesis chapter 12. And I'm uh, very delighted to have Daniel today with me as my uh, helper with the microphone. So he's looking forward to your hands and Sarah is already lifting up her, her hand. Daniel is coming to you, Sarah. And we are gonna hear Genesis chapter 12, verses one to three, one of the most important calls ever placed on a human being in history. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I'll make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you, and I will place a curse on those who harm you. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you. Thank you, sir. The last time 
in the book of Genesis that God spoke was at the Tower of Babel. Here again, God speaks. This time just to one person. He speaks to Abraham. And he tells Abraham something that rattled his world. Because at that time, Abraham was not a spring chicken. Did you hear how old was he? 75 years old. The Bible tells us that he lived in the city of, you, uh, many of you pronounce it Ur, it's actually Ur of Chaldea. And Ur of Chaldea was in the country of Babylon. So the family of Abraham, Abraham including, they still lived at that time in Babylon. And here God comes to Abraham, back then Abram, and he says, Abram, I want you to get out of Babylon. I want you to get out of Babylon, out of the things you know, out of the things you love, and come and follow me. When was the last time God called you to get out of your personal Babylon? Out of the comfort zone of your own life? When was the last time he rattled your world and asked you to go somewhere where you're going to speak the language with an accent? Where you're not going to be accepted? Where you're going to be looked down upon? and sometimes proclaimed weird because of your particular habits and culture. And how did you respond to the call of God to get out of your bubble? I can only imagine Grandpa Abram going to Grandma Sarah, Sarai and say, honey, we gotta move. <laughs> Why? Well, because God, because God told me so. Okay, I have a few questions. Do they have moles <laughs> to the place where you're going? Because, friends, you don't, may not realize, Ur of Chaldea, it was unearthed. And the sophistication of amenities in the city amazed the explorers. People had bathtubs in their, in their homes, they had uh, running waters coming in their homes, it was something else. So I can only imagine Sarah asking question after question and the only answer Abram was able to give is I don't know. And boy I can tell you women do not like this answer. <laughs> So here God comes to Abraham and the very first words that come out of the mouth of God is a call, a command that at least I have not found translated in any English Bible. I'm going to pronounce it first in, in Hebrew then I'm going to translate it. God comes to Abraham and says Lech Lecha. In our Bibles uh, we read uh, go out. But Lech Lecha means more than that. Lech Lecha is a very strange expression that is used only three times in the whole Bible. Lech Lecha literally means walk towards yourself. Basically, God was calling Abraham to find his true self, his true calling, his true purpose in life. And God was telling Abraham, you cannot find your true calling of life marinating in, within your comfort zone. You cannot find your purpose of life in Babylon. You gotta get out of there. Only on two occasions, God uses this expression, 
Lech Lecha as a command. And both of them are directed to Abraham. Because Abraham was supposed to become the father of faith, the father of all believers, and to give them example what it means to follow God. The expression Lech Lecha, walk towards yourself, is used in this text that we just read, when God <coughs> hijacked the life of Abraham at the age of 75, when he is ready to go into retirement. And to ascend him and send him on a mission field. The second time God uses the, the command Lech Lecha was again to Abraham. And it was on this morning when God woke up Abraham to tell him Lech Lecha and go to the Mount Moriah and sacrifice your son, your only begotten son whom you love. When God issues this command to us to go uh, toward ourselves, to find who we really are, to find who we really are in our relationship with God, He calls us because this is the only way we can realize the plan of God, and this is the only way we can change the lives of others and make history. People who stand and stay within their comfort zones never make spiritual history, friends. Mm -hmm. To walk toward yourself requires to walk out of your comfort zone. To walk toward yourself means to turn your back on all the things that make you comfortable when God asks you to walk out. God appeared to Abraham and said, Abraham, I want you to turn your back on all the things that you love, on all the things that you know, on all the things that you built your whole life. I want you to turn back on your business portfolio, to sell all your properties, and to pack your luggage and go. And I want you, when Sarah asks you the thousand or million questions, to calmly tell her that you don't know. And to ask her too, to trust me and to let go. This is a pretty tall order, isn't it? How many here at the age of 75 are willing to, to change directions in life? How many here are rather willing to retire and take it easy? The call on Abraham meant also breaking some of these uh, long-cherished relationships with family, with friends, with community that you've built your whole life. Yet when God asks you to leave Babylon, don't try to fix what he is trying to break. And don't try to break what he is trying to build for you. God called Abraham to get out of his country, out of his comfort zone, out of his friends, out of the place where he felt good. Because when we stay and marinate within the places when we feel good, we cannot bless anyone. Maybe a little bit the, the people around us. But we cannot make spiritual history. We cannot transform the world. And worst of all, we cannot know God. God's call to Abraham is expressed in two commands that he gives him. In the Hebrew text that we just read, there are two commands. We explore the first one I'm going to summarize again. The first imperative, God says, walk towards yourself. That means out of your country, out of your family, out of your father's house. Walk out of Babylon to the place where I am going to show you. I'm not going to tell you even the name of the place. Become a foreigner in order to know me. Become uncomfortable with the language of a country that you don't know 
Some of us even don't realize that when Abraham went to Canaan, they did not speak exactly the same language like his language. Some of us do not understand that the behavior of Abraham looked strange to the people where he went to live. Some of us may not understand what it means to have a million questions asked by, by the person that you love the most, your wife, and to not be able to answer them. Because women in this world look uh, guy, uh, for guys who have the, the answers and who can project security. And God said, I'm going to be your security. And when Sarah asks you, tell her that your insurance policy is called G-O-D. The second imperative that God gave to Abraham is be a blessing. In some of our translations in English, it says, uh, you will be, I'll make you a blessing. Actually, when you read it in Hebrew, it's a command, be a blessing. Many of us live within our selfishness, within our shell, and we are blessing to no one else. God says, I want you intentionally to be a blessing. And in order to be a blessing, I'm going to uproot you from the place where you feel that you belong. I'm going to place you to, uh, among people that you don't know. And then you're going to be a blessing. Like Abraham, God commands all of us to be a blessing. But together with the command to be a blessing, he also tells us, that you and I will not be able to unless we adopt the attitude of foreigners, of pilgrims, of strangers in the place where, where we are. Because foreigners are extra sensitive. They see and hear things that uh, the people who are within their comfort zone do not hear and do not see. This is why the Bible repeats so many times. Watch yourself how you treat the foreigner. Because God wants each one of us to become a foreigner. To, to get a new set of eyes. A new set of hearts. A new set of uh, uh, perceptions that will make us able to see the world through the eyes of God. And fortunately staying within our comfort zones renders us numb and unable to see the world through the eyes of God. This is why he says, I want you to get out, move. Some of you may say, well, how can I know that God is uh, actually asking me to, to move? How, how can I know that God is, right in this moment, is moving me to go in a particular direction? The question is very, uh, I mean, the, the answer is very easy to this question. When God hijacks your life, you'll know it. And God always hijacks our lives not in order to destroy us, not in order to destroy our lives, but to make us a blessing to someone, to place us in a place where otherwise we'll not go on our own. And when God hijacks your life, you're going to know it. You're going to fill it with every fiber of your body because it's not going to feel comfortable. It, it may even sound and look horrible. So the question is, what do you do when God hijacks your life? Let's see the, the answer. It's in verses 4 to 8. Who would like to read for us verses 4 through 8 of Genesis chapter 12? Mary Fon, thank you. So Abram, Just wait for the microphone so that the people online can also hear you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, 
and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Thank you, Mary Friend. By the way, Mary Friend is uh, absolutely amazing. I, uh, she just gave me a few, uh, few minutes ago a set of Bulgarian uh, type of cookies. She's, <laughs> she's really spoiling me. <laughs> so now, now to the story. How do you know when God has hijacked your life? Well, as I said, it's going to feel uncomfortable. And then what do you do when you feel that God has hijacked your life? Do you remember the command of God to Abraham? He told him, Lech Lecha. Get yourself going towards yourself. And out of your country, out of the comfort zone. The response of Abraham in verse 4, verse 4 begins this way. Abraham. The same word. When God told him walk, Abraham walked. As a matter of fact, if you have paid attention to your Bible, you will notice that all the great heroes of the Bible are portrayed as people who are walking with God. Have you noticed that? It's not by chance, friends. This is the true response of faith. Abraham decided to walk with God, traveling to a country that he does not know where, he, where this country is. He did not know, God did not tell him in the beginning the name of the country. He did not tell him what he is going to find there. One thing was sure. The place to which they went was not as well utilized with the amenities as Ur of Chaldea from where they are coming from. So Abraham decided to travel without a map to the place where God was leading him. Abraham walked not because it made sense, not because it was easy, not because it was comfortable. but because God said so. And let me tell you something, friends. The greatest leaders of this world are followers of God. God asks us to step out of our Babylons, out of our comfort zones, out of the uh, familiar atmosphere so that we can become followers of God and leaders of people and nations. Friends, I can tell you today, there are worldwide leaders whose name you have not heard or whose names you have long forgotten. But any person in this world with average intelligence, you can mention the name of Abraham whether they'll be Muslim, whether they'll be Christian, or whether they'll be uh, uh, Jewish, they'll know who Abraham is. Because the four of God become true leaders. There is no other way. You follow God. You're going to become a leader. You're going to lead people out of their personal Babylons into a relationship with God. You cannot follow God and not end up being a leader of people, leading them out of their personal Babylons. Uh, by the way, did you notice how old was Abraham when God called him on this mission trip? How old? When God hijacked the life of Abraham, he was how old again? 
Here I would like to share with you a biblical discovery that is going to scare the stew out of you. Are you ready? You're never too old for God to hijack your life. You're never too old for God to hijack your life. Some of the greatest people of this world were way into retirement when God hijacked their lives and started writing spiritual history. The guy who wrote the book that we are just studying and, and uh, preaching on it, the book of Genesis, his name was Moses. He was octogenarian. He was 80 years old. When God called him, when God hijacked his life, and at first, Moses did not feel comfortable. This is how you know that you are hijacked. You don't feel comfortable. You didn't want to go. He had too many questions. And God had only one answer. You gotta go. If you wanna walk towards yourself and find yourself and find the true purpose of your life, you, get a, you, you gotta step out of the comfort zone of your life. Well, friends, sorry to disappoint you. You may, uh, you may have felt, oh, I'm already retired, I'm 75 or I'm 80. God cannot hijack my life now. Think again. And when God hijacks your life, just walk. Or pack your van and drive. Now, I would like you to imagine what happened when Sarah and Abram were packing their van. Probably the years of Abraham were that big. Calloused of listening to questions that Sarah had for him that he was not able to answer. So finally they're in the van and they're driving 100 miles, 200 miles, 300 miles, 400 miles, 500 miles. Are we there yet? Yeah. And he's driving. I, he said, I don't know. 600 miles. Are we there yet? He's driving 700 miles. Are we in the country far, far away yet? I don't know. And one day when they hit 850 miles of driving, God appears in the moving van and he taps uh, Abraham on the, sh uh, on the shoulder and says, we arrived. So Abraham pulls over his moving truck, steps out of the, uh, of the truck and picks from the, uh, from the back of the truck a peck, a landmark with his name, Abraham, property of Abraham. And he started pounding this uh, peck into the ground. When someone steps out of his uh, back door and screams at Abraham, hey you, dumb foreigner, get out of my lawn. Then Abraham moves a uh, few miles away and he starts pe uh, pounding again his uh, landmark Abraham's land till another guy gets out of his uh, back door and, and screams at him get out of here this is my property then finally Abraham takes the deed this land is going to be yours signed by God Almighty himself and he goes to the courthouse and he claims this is my land and the court clerk laughs his brains out are you crazy? This country belongs to the Canaanites. And you know what? The Bible tells us so. When Abraham arrived, the Bible says in verse 6, but the Canaanites occupied the land. The country that God promised to Abraham was already taken. And Abraham lived there for 100 years. Do you know how much real estate he acquired in these 100 years? During these 100 years, Abraham did not build a house and did not possess a single square foot of real estate property. When Abraham died, he had, uh, uh, he had an advance to buy a burial ground. This is the only thing that he possessed in the promised land. 
Back then they were burying people in caves. The only thing he possessed of the land that God told him is his was a burying plot in a cemetery. God was very intentional throughout his whole life to keep Abraham ruthless, to keep him foreigner, to keep him feel almost homeless in the country that God says is his. And while the pagan neighbors of Abraham and Sarah were building houses, building their business portfolios, building their education, building their children's education, and acquiring possessions, Abraham and blessing others. And I would like to ask you today on behalf of God, and I would like to ask myself on behalf of God, what are you building in your life? Who are you blessing with what you are doing? The New Testament sum summarizes the life of Abraham this way. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelled in a land of promise. As what? As a foreigner. Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but confessed that they were what? Foreigners and pilgrims on the earth. On the very earth that God promises is going to be theirs. For those who live in such a way declare plainly that they seek a homeland. The greatest heroes of the Bible were called to be foreigners to be pilgrims with God on earth. The greatest heroes of the Bible were called to walk with God. And more times than we wish, they had to walk out of their comfort zones and to turn, back, uh, to turn their backs on the things that they loved and cherished. The heroes of the Bible, the Bible teach us to have the attitude that my home is not here. That my home is in the country above. And I'm just traveling to this world. I'm a foreigner and a pilgrim to a country that I've never been before. But God is my guide. And as I follow him, he's going to turn me and he's going to turn you into a leader of people leading them out of their personal Babylons into the country that God has promised to give to all who love him. I would like to ask you at the end of this sermon to pick up uh, out of your bulletin this yellow connection card. I hope you've put at least your name on the front. Every single time I see a card, especially with a prayer request, I take the time to pray for you. But even when I see just your decisions, I pray for you to be able to carry them on. So here are the three action steps that I would like to suggest. First, my life feels like a journey without a map to a country far, far away. Lord, fill my heart with the assurance that you are leading me. Second, when God hijacks my life, Uprooting me from the comfort zone, I will trust and obey him. And finally, Lord, help me to live as a foreigner in this world, never forgetting that this world is not my ultimate home.
Before I invite you to bow your heads with me for the benediction, just would like to remind you, we'll give you time for those of you who uh, need to go. I'm going to greet you at the door. But those who would like to stay, please stay probably five to ten minutes max after uh, the end of the service. We're going to have the memorial service for Jim Wallace. Would you please now bow your heads with me for the benediction. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named, that he will grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell within your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in his love may be able to comprehend together with all the saints the height, the length, the depth, the, uh, the riches of his love. And now, to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you can ask or even imagine, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. With my whole heart I love you, with my whole heart I adore you, with my whole heart I lift you up, my Lord, loving Lord of